I want to talk about the five mistakes that you're probably making that's not giving you good sound. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delasalo with Audioholics. I wanted to do a video about five potential things that you might be doing in your home theater or in your two-channel music room that's leading to not great sound. You could get much better sound if you make some adjustments. I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm just pointing out some things that I've noticed, things that could be improved upon. And sometimes you don't always have that luxury. Sometimes you don't have the flexibility to move furniture or to better optimize your speaker locations. But it's something to think about if you're designing a new space, a new listening space that's dedicated for music or home theater. Maybe you could do things differently than what you normally see that's on the web. So let's start with the first number one, and it's called placing seats against a side or back wall. That's never a good idea for a variety of reasons. I want to give you a couple of examples, pictures wise, of what I'm talking about. So basically, putting a seat next to a back wall puts you in a maximum pressure area. And the problem with that is you're going to have so much buildup of standing wave base. You're going to have very uneven base, very boomy base. That's number one when you're sitting up against the back wall. The other thing is when you're sitting up against the side wall is now you're off center from your main speaker. So you're not going to have good imaging. And also you're going to be all the way to one side or the other. So you're not going to have a good visual representation of what's going on on the screen. And most likely you're going to be too close to a surround speaker. So you're not going to be in a good surround envelope. So these are just a couple of examples. I've given lots of consultations. As you guys know, I do private consulting and I have a link down below if you want to um, hire me for an hour or so or more. But you can see in this case, this person has their couch right up against that back wall. And in a room like this, because it's a multifunction room, kind of difficult to do it any other way. But it's, it's definitely a challenge to get good bass response and even bass response and also get a good surround envelope because you're really close to those back speakers. Here's a dedicated theater room um, with Valencia seating, which I love. I have Valencia seats myself. And you can see you've got three rows of seating here. Now, it's great to fit as many seats as you can, but really that back row all the way at the back corner and in the back of the wall, I reserve those. I call those the mother-in-law seats because, again, you're so far away from the primary sound, so you're not going to get good stereo imaging there. You're up against the back wall. There's no treatments that I could see in this picture. So there's nothing to deal with the boundary gain issues and, and the uh, standing wave of the back wall. And again, you're close to those surround speakers. So you're going to hear mostly surround effects. Now, in my own personal theater room, I just want to show you, I also have the Valencia Tuscany seats, custom color here. You can see I have two rows of seats. Obviously, my primary money seats are in the front row and it's the second seat towards the window. That's really the center of the room. That's where I get the best sound and imaging. And if you look closer, you can see my back, my back uh, seats are pretty close to that back wall. They're about uh, two and a half, three feet. Ideally, you want them one quarter of the length of the room, and that's a 25 foot room. So I really wanted to have you know, about seven feet if I could, or six or seven feet. I don't quite have that, but I did address it with the acoustics, as you can see here, I've got real traps. Um, Ethan Weiner was, was kind enough to donate those real traps for the back wall. And those actually do a lot of good mid bass to upper bass absorption. So it kind of helps to even out the bass response in there. Again, it's not perfect. And it is not where I would put someone that's really critical about listening to music or movie theater watching in that back row. But you got to do what you can to make it as good as you can. And in fact, I even have a diagram, and I'll get into it later in this video, that talks about you know where your good seating locations are. And obviously, up against the back wall or up against the side wall, if you could avoid putting seats there, more power to you. You're going to have better sound. So let's go to number two. Placing speakers in an empty alcove behind an acoustically transparent screen. This has become wildly popular on the internet. I see it everywhere. I see it on the AVS forum. I, I see pretty much anywhere I go, I see people doing it. And I understand the logic. You want to hide the speakers. You want to maximize your floor space, especially in most theater rooms are not very big. So you don't want to 
take up too much space with these hulking towers or big subwoofers. And again, I'm not disparaging anybody. I'm just showing examples. I saw this video that Youthman did. He covered a Perilisten system in one of his videos. This is a phenomenal speaker system. This is one of the best on the market. But look at where it's placed. It's placed in an alcove. The speakers are so close together. They're raised up, so they're pretty high. So if you don't have proper seating um, relative to where those speakers are, you're not going to be in the best axis of integration of that speaker. And those subwoofers are so close together that you don't really have multi-sub in this case. That's just two subwoofers really close together. It's one super sub. And you can see there's no, I mean, at the time of seeing this video, there was no acoustic treatments back there. So you're dealing with a lot of speaker boundary interference issues. And we're going to do a more detailed video on this in the coming weeks. I'm going to have Anthony Gramani and Matthew Pose. We're going to come up with alternatives to how you can make this better. But I wanted to show you another picture I found. I think this was on ABS Forum. The JBL M2 speaker system and some custom subs here. Really good speakers again. Look at all that thick fiberglass they put in the back behind those speakers. That addresses some of the speaker boundary interference issues I was telling you about. Those subs are really still close together. I'm hoping that this person has a sub in the back of the room. And I think the Paralyson system had another sub in the back of the room to kind of even out the bass response as well. But I really would like to see people do more of this. This is called a, a baffle wall. And this puts the speaker flush to the wall. So you pretty much eliminate the speaker boundary interference issues. And you can see the subwoofers are below that alcove. So they're actually coupled to the floor. And you can see a better picture here where they're putting subwoofers in those little cavities. It's always better to put a subwoofer on a floor or in a ceiling as opposed to raising it up on a platform. You want to have that coupling on that floor. It gives you the base loading, gives you more uh, output of your subwoofer. So if you could avoid putting a subwoofer in a raised alcove and put them on the floor in an alcove and then insulate that whole area, you're going to get much better sound. So let's go to number three, setting your speakers to large. Now, you guys know I've done tons of bass management videos. I'll link them up in this description in the playlist. Most of the time, I'd say 90% of the time, you should set all your speakers to small I know if you have a large tower, you think, oh, I should have all the bass coming out of those and my subwoofers, but that could be an operation nightmare if you don't know what you're doing. And especially this is true if you're using ported speakers and sealed subwoofers or vice versa. If you don't get the bass alignment correct between your large speakers and your subs, you could actually find you're going to be canceling out some really low frequencies as a result. My example is I have the Perilisten 7 STs in my family room. Those are ported speakers, and I have two JL Audio in-wall uh, in sealed subwoofers. When I try to play everything full range, I was losing bass below 20 hertz until I set my speakers to small because the port slope frequency or the high pass is different on a ported speaker than it is on a sealed sub. So in my case my bet would either be to base manage those speakers, even though they're really capable high output speakers or to seal those ports to get better integration with my subs. So you just gotta be careful. I'm gonna tell you guys 90% of the time, set your speakers to small. You're gonna get better integration. Get yourself at least two subwoofers. Let the subwoofers do the heavy lifting of bass at 80 Hertz and below and get some really good capable speakers that have similar kind of output characteristics above 80 Hertz and bass manage them and you'll get a better blend, you'll get better integration and you'll be happier with the sound. So number four, uh, poor subwoofer placement. And again, we've done tons of videos on this. And in fact, I have a little diagram I think I have here I wanna show you. So this is a basic diagram that shows you if you have a rectangular room, I really like putting a sub in each corner if you can. You get the, the best coupling, you excite all the room modes evenly and you just get better bass distribution. So every seat is a good seat. Then you could apply EQ to get rid of the bumps in your room, smooth out the bass response and have consistent bass for every seat that you listen in. Now, if you can't put them in the corners, there are other options for placements. There's mid-wall placements. Mid-wall gives you more even bass distribution than four corner, but you get less coupling factor. So you need to use bigger subs if you do that. But subwoofer placement is very important. I hope you guys really understand that just putting two subs in an alcove right next to each other, you just got a super sub. You really are not doing multi-sub in that case. 
Now, number five, last but not least, is addressing your room acoustics. I can't tell you how many times I've given consultations to people where they buy all this incredible equipment. They buy Macintosh, they buy Trinov, they buy great speakers, Revel, Perilisten, RBH, JBL, you name it. And they put it in a room that's an echo chamber. And what do I mean by an echo chamber? I'm going to show you a couple of examples here. Now, this is a beautiful room. I mean, it looks contemporary, but you've got a lot of solid surfaces that are untreated. You got that front wall with the TV, you've got tile floors, no treatments in here. Obviously, this is a multimedia room, so you're not going to be able to do a whole lot of passive room treatments in here. But if you're serious about sound, you really need to get a listening space that is not too echoey, that has some control of the mid to upper bass frequency and absorption. And I, this is just a picture of my theater room. I, I threw up an RT60 decay time, and I did a video on this as well. And the goal really, oh, you can't see it with the comments. Let me turn the comment off. The goal really is you want an RT60 decay time that's very flat and even from 100 hertz out to 20 kilohertz. And you want it to be anywhere between the range of 300 milliseconds all the way to five, maybe 600 milliseconds. Once you get above 700 milliseconds, it starts becoming a room that's just too echoey and it's just not very conductive of good sound. Now, my theory here, and I'll have Matthew talk more about this in the near future, but in RT60 decay time, when you're dealing with two-channel music, you tend to want the RT60 a little higher because you're only having two speakers in that listening space and you need to rely more on the reflections of the room to give you that spaciousness. And as you add more speakers, you need to rely a little bit less on the room reflections and more on allowing all those speakers to properly produce the sound and not be in such an environment that it's too echoey and it just kind of blurs things together. So if I'm doing a two-channel room, I like an RT60 decay time of maybe five to 600 milliseconds. But if I'm doing a home theater, I like it anywhere from three to 500 milliseconds. A lot of this is personal taste. I'm not gonna tell you that any, there's no magic number to it, but these are just some guidelines. And obviously you need to watch more of our videos on these topics because we go deeper into these topics so you guys can get better sound. You can maximize your hard earned dollars on all that equipment you're buying, and you could really enjoy it. And the one thing I have to tell you, as you get older and your hearing starts to decline with age, the room acoustics really matter. You really need to control those reflections or it could just overload you. You don't enjoy the music as much. It's not anchored. The dialogue's not anchored. You can't hear the people talking out of the center channel. And of course, the center channel placement and integration is very important. We have videos on that as well. So guys, I hope you found this video useful. Please subscribe, hit that thumb up, and don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics or you want to ask questions. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.